In this short video, I'm going to be discussing how we go about generating radiation for experiments. First of all, we'll talk about X-rays. X-rays are a component of the electromagnetic spectrum. We can see them at the high energy region here, sandwiched between gamma rays and ultraviolet. As we move to higher wavelengths, we go through visible light, through infrared, microwave, and into radio waves. X-rays were first discovered by Röntgen in 1895. X-rays are short wavelength, high frequency electromagnetic waves. That means they have both an electric and a magnetic component that are perpendicular to each other. When we discuss X-rays, we normally characterize them in terms of their wavelength, which we give the symbol lambda. What happens is that the electric field in our X-rays couples to the charged electrons in matter, and that gives rise to the scattering of X-rays that we'll talk about in later videos. So there are two different ways of looking at these electromagnetic waves, and this is the so-called wave-particle duality. On one hand, we could view them as short wavelength electromagnetic waves. Alternatively, we could view them as high-energy particles, photons. The key thing about X-rays is that they have wavelengths of between 0.01 and 100 angstroms, where 10 angstroms is 1 nanometer. The key thing with that is that that wavelength is in the order of the distances between planes of atoms and crystals, and so the two can interact. X-rays are generated when matter is bombarded by high energy particles or photons. In the lab, this is accomplished using a device called an X-ray tube. Electrons are emitted from some sort of filament and accelerated by an applied potential to impact on a suitable metal target. The collision between electrons and atoms uh, generates a lot of heat and a few X-rays. X-ray tubes are extremely inefficient. Uh, less than 1% of the electron's kinetic energy ends up getting converted into X-rays. The rest of it is uh, transformed into heat. So we see here a schematic and a, a photo of a sealed X-ray tube. This is the most common source of X-rays in labs around the world. Up in the top right, we see the picture of a ceramic sealed X-ray tube. Uh, traditionally, this bottom part, the white section, would have been glass, um, but in recent years, it's been uh, replaced by a ceramic piece, uh, which is more. These tubes are more reliable. We can see a schematic here of what the inside of the X-ray tube looks like. So, on the left-hand side, we have a tungsten filament. And this will uh, generate an electron beam that's accelerated towards the metal target using a high potential, 30 to 60,000 volts. And the electrons in that electron beam will impact onto atoms in the metal target. That will cause the generation of X-rays, which will be emitted in all directions, and some of which will pass out through these silver beryllium windows that we see. Um, as we said, this process generates an awful lot of heat as well, um, and so we need to continuously cool um, the X-ray tube with uh, water. Typically, this needs to be in the region of uh, four to six liters per minute, so there's a serious need for cooling of these devices to prevent them melting down. This sealed X-ray tube gives us two types of radiation. Uh, we see these drawn schematically here, the blue line shows us the continuous or Remstrahlung radiation, where the red shows this plus uh, the characteristic radiation, specific wavelengths. And it's these specific wavelengths that we want to use in our diffraction experiments. The continuous spectrum arises from electron deceleration. Not all electrons will decelerate in the same way when they hit the target. And the shortest wavelength radiation will arise from single impact deceleration. All of the kinetic energy is converted to X radiation using the equations here. And what should be apparent is that as we increase the tube voltage, as we move to higher voltages, uh, we will get uh, X rays produced with lower wavelengths. So increasing the tube voltage shifts the minimum wavelength to a lower volume. It also increases the intensity of the generated spectra, as we see here. So you can see here plots for 5, 10, and 40 kilovolts. And in each case, you can note that the um, minimum wavelength 
moving lower, and the intensity of the spectrum overall is increasing. Once you get above some certain critical tube voltage, characteristic lines appear on top of the continuous background. And these arise from quantum transitions in the metal target. They occur at very specific wavelengths, characteristic of the target material. Also, the intensity increases with the accelerating voltage, but the wavelength is not changed. So, for example, we would typically use copper targets. Most of the targets in our research facility are, are, are copper, and the characteristic wavelength here is around about 1.54 angstroms. But we see, as you note from the last graph, we see various different characteristic lines observed. We call these lines K, L, M, and so on. So here we see again uh, the characteristic um, voltage um, causing generation of uh, radiation. So we can see in the blue case, we're below this, this critical voltage of 5 kilovolts, and we don't have any characteristic radiation being produced. Where we increase the tube voltage to 10 kilovolts, we start to see these K, what are like what are called K alpha and K beta lines emerging. An electron with kinetic energy, E, knocks out a core shell electron from the atom in the metal target. The ejected photoelectron leaves behind an empty core hole. This is an unstable configuration, so an electron has to transfer down from a higher energy level to fill that core hole, and accordingly, there's a, the emission of a photon with an energy disproportional to that uh, difference in energy levels between the two um, electron orbitals. This is why we need um, a certain critical tube voltage to see these characteristic lengths, because the electrons must have sufficient energy to knock out an electron from the core shell. So we can view this uh, in this short animation here, where up in the left-hand corner we have an electron from the filament, and then we have some sort of metal target atom down here. So our electron from the filament comes in and impacts with an atom in the metal target, causing it to be ejected from the atom. This leaves us with an unstable configuration, with this hole present in one of the core shells. This has to be rectified, and so an electron will transfer down, in this case from the L shell to the K shell, to fill this core hole and stabilize the atom. In doing so, it has to release the radiation with of a photon, delta E equals H times the frequency. Um, and for many metal atoms, this is in the range of X radiation. So we can see from this we have a, a, a set of possible transitions that could occur. We could have transitions to the K shell, we could have transitions to the L shell if it was an L electron that had been ejected. We could even have transitions to the M shell if it was one of those electrons that had been knocked out. Each series here, the K series, L series, M series, will have several discrete possible lines. So you could have, for example, K alpha lines, K beta lines and so on. The ones we want for X-ray diffraction tend to be the K-alpha lines. And these come from transitions from the L-shell to the K-shell. So K-alpha um, is from L to K. If the transition was an M-shell electron moving down to fill the K-shell, this would give us K-beta radiation. And depending on the energy difference between the, the different shells, we would get uh, different wavelengths you can see that EL minus EK is less than EM to EK. It's less of a, a full, lower energy, and so um, K alpha has a higher wavelength than K beta. Also, the L to K transition is more likely, more probable than M to K, and so we see intensity ratios of about 5 to 1 for K alpha to K beta lines. <clears throat> Each line may be composed of a doublet or a triplet, two or three peaks or more, um, and this is because the different shells all have different sub-levels or sub-orbitals of slightly different energy. Transitions from different orbitals in the same shell result in X-rays of slightly different wavelength. And so from uh, the 2p orbitals, uh, different 2p orbitals, we see K-alpha-1 radiation, K-alpha-2 radiation. 
For K alpha 1 transition, A is more probable than K alpha 2, so for copper, the ratio of K alpha 1 to K alpha 2 to K beta is 5 to 2.5 to 1. I'm now going to move on to talk about some alternative sources. Uh, the first of which we'll talk about is rotating anodes. We don't have any of these within material science here in Sheffield, uh, but they are out there and they are worthy of discussion. As we saw from earlier on, the main drawback of the sealed X-ray tube is uh, the localized buildup of heat from the impact of electrons onto a small area of the anode metal target. One way of getting around this problem is to rotate the anode during operation. The anodes typically in a rotating anode source are also typically larger, but this means that the impact of the electrons is being spread continuously over a much wider area. Um, and uh, with good cooling, we can then safely operate at much higher energies, 15 to 18 kilowatts, for example, instead of perhaps 1.6 kilowatts for a sealed X-ray tube. So we've got much higher intensities that come out of this, and it's particularly good for in-situ experiments where you've got small samples inside a, a cell or something that's going to absorb a lot of the x-ray beam. But they come with a much higher cost attached and there are a lot more problems with them and you need to do annual maintenance on them which is very expensive as well. So generally most labs don't see um, the benefits as outweighing these, these costs. But as I say they are very good for specific applications. And of course if you want more intensity you can just go to a synchrotron source. Synchrotrons work by accelerating electrons to close to the speed of light along a curved path. Electrons want to fly in a straight line, so forcing them away from their preferred path causes the electrons to emit intense radiation beams um, of synchrotron radiation tangentially to the beam path. And if you then happen to pop um, experimental stations along these, uh, the path of these intense beams, you can use the radiation that's produced. Obviously, building and operating a synchrotron is very expensive, so there are very few individual institutions that would be able to afford this. Um, and so we tend to be talking about the central facilities that we apply for beam time uh, at and then go and use their facilities for experiments on a short-term basis. You get a parallel beam, very high resolution, very high intensity, so you can do great in-situ work, um, very short experience, experimental times, time-resolved experiments become possible as well. And also they tend to be tunable, so you can separate out the different wavelengths using crystal monochromators, which we'll talk about in later uh, videos. Another option would be to use neutrons. Uh, neutrons are a bit different, obviously, uh, in that they're scattered by atomic nuclei instead of electrons. But they're also scattered by the magnetic spins of electrons. So you can get information both about the crystal structure and the magnetic structure uh, using neutrons. One of the things we'll talk about later is how X-rays are scattered proportional to the atomic number, so heavier, denser atoms scatter X-rays more. With neutrons, one of the advantages is that this is not the case. Scattering lengths are not proportional to atomic number. So hydrogen, lithium and oxygen are poor scatterers of X-rays, but decent scatterers of neutrons. Also, with the XRD, it's hard to differentiate between neighbouring atoms because they scatter X-rays in a very similar manner. But neighbouring atoms can have very different neutron scattering lengths. Um, and again, these facilities are very expensive and we have to go through beam time application processes to use them, but it can give us uh, some great information. Two different flavours of neutrons, if you like. Um, we can use constant wavelength sources, such as the ILL in Grenoble in France, or we could use time-of-flight facilities like the ISIS uh, facility in Carbon Oxford in the UK. Constant wavelength is directly analogous to XRD, so the nuclear reactor source gives you a continual spectrum of wavelengths, and then you have to use a monochromator to filter out all but one particular wavelength. The beams tend to be quite weak and they're not particularly monochromatic, um, and obviously it's not a very efficient way of using the neutron flux that you've got. But when we come to talk about Bragg's law, um, the D spacings and theta are variables because the wavelength of the wavelength is fixed, so it's directly analogous to X-ray diffraction. For time of flight facilities, these use a particle accelerator to bombard a heavy metal target with high energy particles like 
distillation occurs, um, producing about 30 neutrons per proton, given a very high flux for diffraction experiments, for example. Um, and you use the whole neutron spectrum, instead measuring the time of the neutrons, arrive at fixed detector values. So in terms of Bragg's law, P and lambda are the variables, and theta is fixed.